Thanks. So first of all, let me thank the organizers for organizing this workshop. It's, it's really unreal to actually be standing in front of people and not just alone in front of my laptop. So let's see if I still know what to do here. And also for giving me the opportunity to give a talk here. So thanks, it's, it's an honor. And before I start getting into the details, let me start by telling you um, on which works this is based on and also highlighting my collaborators. I will actually make mainly speak about homogeneous space times. And that has been done in collaboration with Jose Figueroa Farrell and one of his PhD students, Ross Grassi. But we also looked into lower dimensional theories and these lower dimensional theories we looked, I looked together with um, Javier Matulich and Jakob Salzer and Eric Bergschoff, Daniel Gromilla, Jan Rossell and Max Riegler. And later we were also joined by Jelle Hatong. I haven't put any references into the slides, so please look into this paper to, to, to get more information on the super interesting earlier work this is based on, and also feel free to ask any questions at any point. All right, um, the plan is roughly, um, I will mainly talk about the maximally symmetric space times and only a little bit about some algebraic consideration for the lower dimensional theories. And in, th in that sense, I will just set the stage for the more detailed discussions and the uh, more recent papers. And I'm sure Daniel Gromilla will make an excellent job on Thursday talking about these lower dimensional theories. And this talk is from 11 to 12 on higher spins and non-ADS holography in lower dimensions. So this could be seen a little bit of setting the stage for Daniel's talk. All right, so let's start by some motivation. And uh, in general, I will be quite, let's say hand wave and just motivational and will not um, shoot Lie algebras the whole time at you. But if you want to see a, li a little bit about it, it's here on the blackboard, but I will also try to describe it in words along the way. But it, when I say maximally symmetric space times, what I guess comes to mind is the maximally symmetric Riemannian spaces that you might have heard, which is Euclidean space, the sphere or hyperbolic space, or their Lorentzian cousins, um, which is Minkowski space, De Sitter space, or anti De Sitter space. So just speaking intuitively at this point, what are the, 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 the properties these maximally symmetric spaces have? Um, if you look at their uh, metrics, they have the maximum amount of symmetries, in other words, maximum amount of killing vectors. And the property is that basically every point looks the same. And there is also symmetry connecting each of these points. And the fact that basically, roughly speaking, every point looks the same has some very nice consequences in the sense that since my point and Laura's point, for example, are really the same to some extent, I can as learn as much as I, I can learn everything about the space time by just looking at my point and everybody else will figure out the same things by just restricting to his neighborhood. So a lot can be analyzed by just looking at one's neighborhood. And this is leads in the end to, to, to that complicated problems can be reduced to, to linear algebra very often. And that is also similar to Lie groups, which are much more complicated than Lie algebras. And one can learn a lot about properties of Lie groups by just analyzing the Lie algebras. So why are they important and or interesting? So one thing, of course, where they are inter um, used are um, as backgrounds for physics, for example, Minkowski space for relativistic quantum field theory. Another way to think about them is, for example, as thinking as vacuums for general relativity or as empty universes. Or another way to think about it, and this will be come clear soon, they are homogeneous spaces. And we saw um, some very nice lectures on Cartan geometry, where it was also explained that, to some extent, an interesting starting point for generalizations in terms of Cartan geometry are by starting with homogeneous spaces. OK. At this point, you might ask yourself, as people have done before, what happened to Galilean space? I mean, if you look, if you take your favorite classical mechanics book, 
you will suddenly realize, for example, in Arnold's book, you will realize that there is uh, also a Galilean space that actually has the same amount of symmetries, but not necessarily a non-degenerate metric. And what I want to argue is that very often when you talk about maximally symmetric spaces, as for example in this book by Carroll, one is actually restricting to Lorentzian maximally symmetric spaces. And one could argue that there are maximally symmetric spaces beyond the Lorentzian cases that are in some sense on equal footing. So the question then is, what are all these spaces with the same amount of symmetry? But if you drop the restriction of, having, of them being Lorentzian or Riemannian. And a useful way to try to analyze this is by looking at homogeneous spaces for the simple fact that they are more focused on symmetries and less focused on the metric structure. And let me maybe try to, to, to argue why this could be interesting for the theme of the, for the workshop. I mean, first of all, as I already tried to say that, or as has been already explained in this workshop, is that homogeneous spaces are some of the flat models for underlying Catan geometries. And in this sense, it might be interesting to, to understand what kind of homogeneous spaces are out there and what homogeneous might be interesting for various different reasons. And one could also argue that to some extent it, they share a little bit of similarities with higher spin theories because they also go beyond the usual Riemannian geometric framework. All right. So let's start with a very fundamental review of homogeneous spaces. I'm sure everybody knows this already, but let me still try to motivate a little bit and, and, and get you in the right groove for what I'm going to say later. So, Homogeneous space are two elements. It's a smooth space, basically a manifold, and a conti continuous symmetry acting on this space such that every point is connected continuously to every other point using such a symmetry. Or in other words, or technical, more technical words, transitive Lie group action. And the point of this is just to set the ground for the more not so familiar examples that I will talk about later, and secondly, to transition from this dimension, uh, th this definition of a homogeneous space to something that uh, will be a little bit more useful for what we wanted to accomplish. All right, so as the one of the simplest examples to think about is a homogeneous space is the Euclidean space. And for that, I have to give you exactly this information I've just proposed to you that you need. You need a space, and in this case, this is a two-dimensional plane, and you need the symmetries acting on this plane that connects each point to each other point. And these are exactly, for example, the rotations and translations. And since I've given you these two things, and these symmetries connect each point to each other point, I've provided you with a homogeneous space. One thing that one is often interested in if one has some kind of homogeneous space are the invariants. And one of the invariants of this homogeneous space is a non-degenerate Riemannian metric. So this is the warm app example, but there's a different way to think about homogeneous spaces, which has also been used already in this workshop, is to somehow put the symmetries first. And in this sense, you start by just starting with a group of symmetries, a Lie group in this sense, ISO2. And additionally to this Lie group, you, give, you have to give and provide a second thing, which is the subset of symmetries that close or a closely subgroup. And in this sense, you can reconstruct the space by quotienting the Lie group by the closed Lie subgroup, or basically, roughly speaking, ignoring the rotations. And then you can also see that basically the, the points, each translation provides you with a point, roughly speaking. So what has now happened is that we have now a, a different way to think about homogeneous spaces, which is really by putting the symmetries first and providing the symmetries and a subgroup of symmetries. And by that, I've not somehow argued this is a, or made plausible at least that this other definition of homogeneous space, but not just giving you a manifold and transitive Lie group action, but something that is sometimes called a climb pair that is a Lie group and a closed Lie subgroup. Let's maybe as a last warm up to some extent, understand um, that, that the probably most famous homogeneous space, if you like, which is Minkowski space, at least for high energy physicists. And 
try to understand Minkowski space using this concept. And so I have to provide the symmetries, which is the Poincaré group. They consist out of rotations, boosts, and spatial and time translations. And I have to give you the second element, which is the subgroup. And let me also mention at this point already that this is not a unique choice, right? So for the Poincaré group, you might wonder how many possible subgroups I can give you to still get a four-dimensional space. And I, I guessed at some point, and I was wrong by infinite, because it's actually infinitely many different homogeneous spaces you could construct. Um, so, so just to tell you, the important part is that you can, you know, take the rotations and boost, so the Lorentz group, and by giving you these two elements, I have now construct, uh, given you all the tools to construct the homogeneous space, or have defined the homogeneous space, if you like. And just as a sanity check, to go back to Minkowski space, I quotient the Poincaré by Lorentz, and it's also easy to see that what basically remains are the spatial and time translations, and they also have the right dimension for what you, uh, what you would expect from Minkowski space. Okay, and finally, the invariant of Minkowski, uh, of Minkowski space is a non-degenerate Lorentzian metric. Okay, sure, please. Um, at this point, I have mainly just tried to, to uh, uh, sorry, the question was if I've imposed any conditions. Yeah, so the question was if I've imposed already at this point any conditions. Okay, as if I've imposed, a, um, if I've imposed um, already some additional conditions rather than being isotropic, it was this somehow the question? Or maybe to answer the question already from the start, at this point I've just tried to, uh, I've just tried to define Minkowski space at this point. I will later impose some additional conditions that I will spell out more precisely. But at this point I've, I've just tried to, to define Minkowski space and the one way to do this is to basically provided with the full group and a closed subgroup that one can take in any basis to some extent, if you like. But I, I think I, I will probably answer the question later. If not, please ask me again. Um, a last step before I go into the details um, is um, to simplify our lives. And for that, I, we go from a Lie group and a closed Lie subgroup to a Lie algebra and a Lie subalgebra. And in that sense, to some extent, we are not, not looking at global properties. We are just in one way to think about it. We are just investigating the simply connected universal covering spaces. And one thing that is also quite, quite nice in general about homogeneous spaces, a lot can be said without ever introducing any coordinates. There's been a lot of work already done by a lot of smart people. So you can just often stare at your Lie pair and already conclude a lot of things without ever lifting your pen. All right, so summary homogeneous spaces are characterized by a Klein pair, a Lie algebra G and the H, a Lie subalgebra of G. And let me emphasize that very often when one thinks already about some group, at least I, or often, this is just when we think about some groups, we actually think already about homogeneous spaces. Because if you think about the Poincaré group, when you're saying these are boosts, these are translations, you already think implicitly acting on some space. So just the abstract Lie group of Poincaré is often not what people are interested in, but more like already a group with some subgroup that you have specified at some point. All right. So let me now try to, to go closer to maximally symmetric space times. And for that, I probably should say that there are different words for it that I've, I found and, and I, I just chose because I think this is a useful word, but the, we also have called them spatially isotropic or kinematical space times, basically by the great work by Barclay and Levy Leblanc who pion pioneered this who, and who called them kinematical space times. And 
this maximum asymmetric space term are a specific class of homogeneous spaces. I will now try to explain a little bit how they can be characterized and try to, 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 to provide some intuition on how they can be connected and where, they, where and why they are inter interesting and relevant. And, and, and this is now pro hopefully makes clearer what kind of restriction we put into our classification. So we start by really just a Lie algebra consisting out of the following elements, rotations, boosts, spatial translations, and time translations. And the thing we somehow put into this is really just written down here. And more explicitly, this is, these are the SOD generators that I've written down here explicitly on the blackboard. And so this is SOD, and B and P are just vectors under rotations to some extent. And H is a scalar. And this is again also written here explicitly. And up to that, the only thing we really imposed is just consistency of the Lie algebra itself. And at this point, you can start by writing down all possible Lie algebras that are consistent. And that's what one can do. The reason this is actually possible is that the imposition of this rotational invariance is pretty strong. So to really write down a Lie algebra, you have to you, you have to be rotational invariant. And in practice, this means, for example, if you want to write down HP accommodator of this form, you cannot just write down H here because this is not rotational invariant. The symbols you're allowed to use are delta, this goes back to while, but the delta symbol and the epsilon tensor of the dimension. For example, you can write down something like this, sorry. Or you can also, and that, is, that tells you already that lower dimensions are a little bit trickier, you can also write down something like, say, this. Okay, so in, to some sense, you, this is the requirement of rotational invariance. That you, so you can start by writing down all the Lie algebras and then classify all consistency requirements, basically the Jacobi identity. And once this is done, you have basically a, a list of Lie algebras. But as I've already tried to explain, this is not enough for having a homogeneous space. This is not just a list of Lie algebras. And so the next thing to do is to search for Lie subalgebras. And the Lie subalgebras are imposed to really have just the right dimension for the space to have also the right dimension. So basically, you quotient by the rotations and one of the vectors, and then you end up with a in four dimensional space, basically. And at this point, actually, the, I think that the, the boosts really get their meaning because before, I think that, that there is no real choice between what is a boost and what is a translation. But now, what we usually take in this subalgebra by which a quotient is what you could call a boost, or at least what I will call a boost in the following. And okay, that's again something you can do. And if you have done that, you have now a list of Lie algebras with Lie subalgebras, and you have now a list of homogeneous spaces. And now you would still like to probably understand a little bit what this kind of homogeneous spaces are about. And one way to, to try to analyze that is to search for invariance and then characterize the space time. And final thing you might do is to check if these boosts are actually, the orbits are actually non-compact because if the, the orbits of the boosts are always compact, it's probably better to call them rotations. And that's of course the way to get, to be sure you don't, ha you haven't put, haven't, don't have like the sphere as a space time. I mean, you, it's still part of the classification, but you, probably wouldn't call it a space time in the usual sense. Okay, having done that, you can summarize the result by this um, graph, please. Exactly, yeah. So what they put in is first, they specified three plus one dimensions. So we generalized it to any dimension. And actually, as I already showed is the lower dimensions are much, much more, <laughs> Hard, actually, the much harder work. The second thing they did is they imposed something. Actually, I think they themselves in the paper said already exactly parity invariance and time reversal. And actually, I can show you which which spaces are the new ingredients that they missed because they put in this assumption. They actually even say themselves in the footnote, I think, 
that this is not necessarily a very natural assumption or something like this. So, so I think actually they, they, did, they probably did it for technical reasons. I mean, I can understand uh, doing these computations, I can very well understand that you might want to do this technical assumption, but if you want to have all of them, then I can show you what happens. And actually the interesting part is I think the, the, th the new parts, I actually, a few of them are quite interesting. And so I think it's, it's, it's not, the restriction in the end really was to some extent not natural from my perspective. Yeah, I, ex that's true. What they did there but was just Lie algebras. It, it, then they, so they did two things. Exactly, no, no, this is homogeneous spaces, but what they, so the Buckley and Levy Leblot did homogeneous spaces, even though they never called it explicitly, so in their paper, I think, but I think that's what they did, to my understanding. And with mutes, they just looked at the Lie algebras. So there they just up to Lie algebras, but the, the interesting thing is you can have the same Lie algebra with two different homogeneous spaces. One such example, surprisingly, if you like, is the Poincaré algebra, which has two homogeneous spaces in this classification actually already in the work by Barclay and Levy Leblanc. The, the case that, the case that, um, the two cases which both are the same Lie algebra but different homogeneous spaces is actually Minkowski space and ADS Carroll. Exactly, so the same Lie algebra but two different Lie subalgebras. And one time they classified just, uh, just one time they did classify the Lie pairs even though actually they never, <laughs> It's hard to say. It's hard to say what they did because I think they didn't explicitly spell out homogeneous spaces and Lie pairs. But I think that's the right way to interpret the first work by Bach and Levi Leblanc. And the other one is just plain Lie algebras. So they, they wouldn't distinguish in one of the words works between Minkowski space and ADS Carroll. Yes. Exactly, yeah. In, in one case, they did. In the other case, they didn't. <laughs> in the first case, okay, let me try to summarize it again. In the first case, they um, looked at the pairs, I think, even though they didn't spell it out explicitly, but look at it. <laughs> but I think they did. But there they put in some additional assumptions, which led to the fact that, they, that these spaces all were not hit there, and this space wasn't there. And in the other case, they just looked at the algebras in both cases, just for three plus one dimensions. But for the Lie algebras, this is a very different classification that I'm not talking about. But we, uh, so the work, that this is based on also redid the Lie algebra classification. This was done by Jose, but he basically recovered the earlier work that was also just based on Lie algebras. Exactly, yes. Which basically has very, okay, th that is again some maximalist symmetric in the sense that it has the same amount of generators. And again, this kind, kind of, of commutation relations. relations. Yeah, but agreed. It, How you mix translations with boosts. Exactly, you basically change, exchange translations and boosts. But that was already, but to still get all of them is not, depending how you like, trivial or not trivial. <laughs> So it's, 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 it's a different property you cannot change. Sure. You always quotient out the compact uh, sub, sub algebra somehow, mm -hmm. but you can always play with non-compact generators. So. I mean, you, the, 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 the part that is that the quotient out is not compact because it's usually the boosts and the boosts. No, but inside the sure. compact sub algebra that are rotations, and this yes. one you always quotient, right? But you exactly. play the rotations and one, one vector, and then you have to figure out what kind of possibilities you have for each Lie algebra, and that's. Basically, the, the, the two differences. One time you just look at the algebras, and one time you exactly do that. You try to, this is what I tried to explain here. You search for least sub algebras with one, with the rotations and one vector. And this vector is then usually the interpretation for it is to call it a boost, if you like, if it's non compact, I think. Then it's a Carroll boost or a Galilei boost, but it's usually what we call boost. But I agree, yeah. But it's a little bit of a subtle difference in these two works. Yeah. 
Okay, so the difference was really to, to drop these assumptions, and I will tell you which spaces now showed up that were left out earlier. And um, also, as I said, it, we didn't restrict in dimensions. And actually, the lower dimensional cases are a little bit more work, but I don't, will not comment too much on it. But I have to admit, it was a beautiful paper by Buck and Levi Leblanc. So he even got a nice email from him. All right. So, um, The thing can be summarized in this, this graph, and it's, it's very similar already to the graph that also Bakke and Levi LeBlanc already have in their paper. So let me try to, to explain to you what this is about. So each of these corners is actually an inequivalent homogeneous space, and each of these spaces satisfies um, the imposed conditions. And each of these errors should be seen as a limit or as a contraction or in physical terms, really, it's something like you approximation of something. And you can see already that the maximally symmetric Lorentzian space times, so they are thankfully there, otherwise this classification would be a little bit disappointing, I think. And um, here you can see the limit, the flat limit from DS and ADS to Minkowski space. And I will not comment too much on the Laurentian spaces, but focus on the spaces that might not be so familiar to everybody. And there is, of course, another limit, and this is the lip, this is called the non-relativistic or the Galilean limit. Okay, I can I can show it even completely explicitly if you like, and for that I have to go to the blackboard. I mean, if you take, for example, taking this arrow from here to here, it's really a in univigna contraction of the underlying Lie algebra. For example, the flat limit is taking this algebra here and sending k to zero, specifying this constant, which basically tells you which kind of uh, cosmological constant, if you have positive or negative, and then just setting, oops, k to zero, really is exactly one of these errors, for example. Exactly. So, so, okay. okay, let me maybe try to explain this a little bit more carefully here. So as I told you, each of this, each of this, so first of all, I provided you here with the algebra from the relations for one the algebra G, spanned by J, E, P, and H. And the Lie algebra, the Lie subalgebra is always pro given to you by G and B. J and B, sorry. And the limit, the flat limit now, is taking k, just sending k to zero. For example, you can set tau to one, you can set eta to plus or minus one, depending on if you want to take the limit from ADS or DS, and you can set equally c to one, and then you just send k to zero, and then you have a in intervening contraction and also limit of the homogeneous spaces. This is does this answer the question? So, so, for example, you show that there is no freedom in the HB commutation relation on the right hand side. You don't have an eta uh, freedom. You, cho you cho show that it was. In, in, this is just for what I'm talking about all here is generic dimensions. So, in lower dimensions, there might actually be one there. I, I don't have it in the back of my head, but you showed for generic dimensions, this is basically the full list. I mean, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still missing some of these spaces. For example, this space and this space because they don't show up from a contraction of ADS and DS in this sense. So all I'm showing here is actually a contraction from starting from ADS and DS to uh, EN case, corona cases, and down here. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain this here. But first, I wanted to ask, is it clear now what, what, what the contraction is meant to be here? Let, let's say but for this k, what you say, k to zero. So the, the Lie algebra is for k non-zero and k any and k zero. They are not isomorphic, I suppose, or they are. Okay, sorry. Right. So let me try to uh, explain uh, the question. Are the algebras for k zero and k non-zero isomorphic? And the answer is they are not isomorphic, and that's exactly what I'm trying to show here. Because if they would be isomorphic, I wouldn't have made a limit from one space to another one. Yeah, but okay, good point. So k to zero leads from one Lie algebra to a non isomorphic Lie algebra. It's also an Inino Wigner contraction, and Inino Wigner contractions also lead from one Lie algebra to a 
It's a bit generous limit. Uh, like it's from non Lie algebra to non isomorphic Lie algebra. And what are the two Lie algebras? Sorry? And what are the two Lie algebras? One is maybe Poincare. Yeah, and two Lie algebras are, okay, so this depends on eta. Eta is a free parameter, eta plus one and eta minus one are non isomorphic. And in this sense, this chooses between date starting from anti sitter and d sitter. It's saying plus one or minus one specifically tells you which one is d sitter and which one is anti sitter. And the limit k to zero leads in both cases from anti sitter to Minkowski and from d sitter to Minkowski. But these are really quotient spaces. What are the Lie algebras? <laughs> The limit, limit you can see that is the limit of the Lie algebra, and it also induces a limit on the homogeneous spaces, if you like, because you just yeah. have. Yeah, yeah, sure, I understand. But uh, what are the Lie algebras to start with before the quotient? The Lie algebra to start with <laughs> depend on the parameters here. Yeah. And if suppose you set all parameters to one and add to plus or minus one, then the, what I've written down here is the Lie algebra of ADS or ES. This is SO3, 2. In four, three plus one dimensions for ADS and SO3, 4, 1 for DS, for example. That is the starting point. Does this answer the question? Yeah. And for K equals zero, uh, for, it, for K equals zero, it's Poincare, I suppose. Exactly, right. Okay. Uh, that was the question. Okay, great, sorry. <laughs> but we, we got there in the end, I hope. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, may, may also think so in case sure. of. This the sitter already the sitter Minkowski, we know that these algebras are just in other cases. What is the geometric structure which is P0 and Y? Or you will get to this. I not I hope I will answer the question in the following. If not, please ask again. So I will not say the question yet. I understand from, from this construction that all the homogeneous space they have the same dimension as a manifold, right? Yes. This is obtaining them from contraction. So, uh, for example, in your picture, how do, for example, in formal group, you can either, I mean, SO uh, and N1, you can either think of it as a conformal group on the N minus one sphere, or uh, so how do you how do you see this? You, uh, you would, for the conformal group, for example, you would, okay, let me, let me try it. So, what, how, how would should the conformal group show up here, right? So, for example, if a you say ADS, this is all equivalently the conformal group of something lower, yeah? But the thing I'm, I would mean, I would take a different Lie subalgebra. I've restricted the Lie subalgebra dimension to J and B, and in this sense, I'm in the, almost in the wrong dimension for exactly what I just wanted to try. Right? Okay, so you cannot see this. No, exactly. This is somehow the same as for Minkowski, anti the usual maximum symmetric space times. You restrict to this specific class. But of course, this is an excellent question. This is something we are a little bit looking into because there's an interesting interplay, of course, between having the same E group and different homogeneous spaces related to this group. So, yeah, very nice observation. Are there other questions at this point? Yeah. So, okay, let, 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 let's, I will not be able to finish. So, let's, so that, so each, so each of these symbols is something is a homogeneous space, given by a the algebra and the Lie subalgebra. Each of these arrows should be understood as a in intervening contraction or some some kind of physically speaking as an approximation. Conversely, actually, you can think about the reverse arrow as going to more fundamental physics, if you like. And I've now already hopefully described the, the Laurentian part. So let's go for the the, the non so familiar examples. Actually, the most famous limit is maybe even the limit from Minkowski space to Galilean space, which basically is really the inune Wigner contraction. So in that paper, they really did exactly this error to some extent. And this is the limit to um, Galilean physics, which of course is, is, is something people that, that you're learning um, classical mechanics at. What is maybe not so well known, but is this, is this curved analogies, somehow the d sitter Galilei or anti d sitter Galilei, or also a Newton called Newton hook. There are a lot of, the problem is there are a lot of word, different names for a lot of these <laughs> homogeneous spaces. So I will try to say a few different ones if, if there are. One thing that is somewhat new and that was not part of the classification of um, 
Argent Lieber Leblanc. And the, the reason is also quite simple. You, is there is a one parameter family of Galilean space times that are, is not in the classification. It, you can also see that they exactly don't preserve this additional parity invariance and time reversal invariance. So it's, 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 but they did everything perfect in the sense, of course, they, should, they shouldn't be in the classification. Okay. And one way to think about the Galilean limit is um, to think about the light cone that closes up on an intuitive picture. Then there was the question of invariant structures that, is, um, that are preserved by this isometry. So it's a little bit more subtle, but let me tell you what, what kind of uh, invariants you have. For the flat case, you have a non, uh, for the Lorentzian cases, you have this um, non-degenerate Lorentzian metric. But for the Galilean case, and if you look at just the low dimensional invariants, you don't have any more uh, uh, non-degenerate metric. You have actually a metric, a, a co-metric that is invariant and a one form. And I've written it down here. I hope it's somehow readable, but it's the, the metric itself is degenerate. So you could, could now ask what are the, if you look at the symmetries of these elements in terms of killing vectors, you will actually figure out that this is, is is I think, if I remember correctly, infinite dimensional. And what you have to add is also a connection. And if you add the connection, an invariant connection that you actually also get for this homogeneous space, then you get back actually the Galilean case. But this one-to-one -one correspondence between um, symmetries of, the, of a metric is one of the things that somehow gets lost in this beyond Lorentzian setup. Let's say, okay, this is variant. Yeah, it depends. Okay, no, no, sorry. So, so the question was. Algebra, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. So the, so the question is if I, can, you, can I not construct all the invariants and then look at what leaves this invariant invariant? That's true. You just, the, 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 the question that I'm having now is how many invariants do you want? And I mean, you can say, okay, this is an invariant. And I want to look at the symmetry of just this invariant. Or you add both invariants, and then you want to look at the symmetries of this both invariants. Or if you say, I want to add all of them, and then look at the symmetry of this type invariants, what are the symmetries of that? This might not always be the same result. It depends on how many invariants you want to get. And to some extent, this is more unique in the flat case because you have this metric. But here you have two invariants in the Galilean case. Would you like those more invariants? Or no, uh, the question is if you, if you ask for this structure, if you can see the whole thing, you yes. get the new algebra you can start with. If I just, your concept. If I should, just take these two invariants and look at yeah. vectors of these two elements, I'm not getting back to the algebra. Mm -hmm. okay. You have to add more invariants, exactly. And that, that is the problem, you have a choice to some extent how many invariants you want to add in the start. And there's some conditions you can characterize invariants. And then yeah, that's, that might be true. Yeah, sure. If you add more invariants, as I said, I think if you add the, connect, the invariant connection, then you get back to the original symmetries you put in. But uh, I, I'm not aware of the general statement that is there. There might well be one, but I, I probably you know more than me. <laughs> okay. Good. So um, that was not the Galilean part here, and there is a. Let me also say that you still have boosts in this case, but you have Galilean boosts. So rather than the, the, the well-known Minkowski boosts, to some extent, you have now Galilean boosts. All right, so there is another limit from the Laurentian cases, which is the ultra-relativistic or Carolian limit. And one way to think about it is that the light cone now closes and maybe short, okay. To tell that the name comes from Ellis, yeah, and it's because um, it's, it's from the book of um, Carol, and that's where the name comes from. And it's because Ellis says, well, in our country, you, you generally get somewhere else if you run very fast for a long time, time as we've been doing. And then the Red Queen says, a, a slow sort of country. Now here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep at the same place. If you want, you can get somewhere else, but you must run at least twice as fast as that. So that's where these names come from. The intuition is that you're somehow stuck to a point in these Carolian geometries. And 
Having said that, that sounds of course a little bit weird and you might be interested asking why are we, should we be interested in this generalization with these weird spaces, but you realize, uh, you, will re you can convince yourself that actually you know them already from general relativity by restricting to null hypersurfaces. Null hypersurfaces, this Carolian space in say three plus one dimensions can be seen as a null hypersurface of a four plus one dimensional Minkowski space. So indeed, these Carolian spaces show up very often in terms of null hypersurfaces and actually have been connected by various people to null infinity in general relativity, for example, or also to event horizons and similar things. So indeed, this um, space time show up. And actually, there's one additional space that has also not been in the original work by Bakke Leblanc and Levi Leblanc. And this is actually really the light cone itself which also has is a maximally symmetric space times in terms of all the conditions except this parity invariant. So this is also one generalization with regard to their classification. All right. And finally, um, there is just a, I just want to, I don't want to say too much about it, but um, there are also the um, Aristotelian geometries. And in this case, um, these errors are, a little bit more vague, but let me just tell you these Aristotelian geometries are characterized by the fact that you basically quotient out the boosts because at some for some spaces you still have the that the, the boosts don't affect act effectively on the manifold. And in that case, it's natural to say, why should I even keep them from the start? You might consider getting rid of them. And in that case, you can also classify that. I'm, I'm not sure where this has been done before, but we, we did it in any case. And um and then you end up with these four different spaces. All right, so these are the Aristotelian spaces. And in terms of, if you want to see it in terms of uh, Lie algebras and Lie subalgebras, this is basically at least the limits starting from ADS and DS to all the other ones that are connected directly can be read off from this. That's a good question. I have to admit this, this spaces came a little bit of a surprise and it also hasn't been investigated too much. I mean, we, so, so we try to understand them a little bit better and we do a little bit, but I have to admit, I, I don't have, it's a, it, it, so if you look at the, the, con, the invariant connection you get from this in, um, homogeneous space, in this case, they have torsion. What is invariant connection? I'm not sure if this gives, provides a hint or not, but I have to admit we, I think they are not very well understood, at least by us. So <laughs> maybe by somebody else, but I don't know who. Good. Yeah, exactly. Roughly speaking, yeah. Good. Ooh, okay. So to summarize, we have maximally symmetric space times. We as Lie pairs, as you can see, they are a generalization beyond the Lorentzian Riemannian cases, and to some extent also a generalization of what um, Barclay and Levy Leblanc did, which was already quite a lot, and it generalizes them. So they fall in these four categories Lorentzian, Carolian, and Galilean, and also Aristotelian. And now the next question might be to, to look at general relativity like models for this kind of space time. Similarly, you hand you Minkowski space and you want now general relativity and how would you do this for this kind of spaces? And it's actually a good way to end, I think, because uh, uh, I, was, I was here and I, I couldn't resist because EASY has a nice mission, which is advanced research in math mathematics, physics, mathematical physics, through fruitful interaction between scientists from these disciplines. And I think I, I got interested in this topic by a nice talk by Freeman Dyson, which was the, the topic of some examples of missed opportunities, occasions on which mathematicians and physicists lost chances of making discoveries by neglecting to talk to each other. So in this sense, I, I couldn't, and, and this is actually relevant for what I just showed you, because at some point it was realized that the symmetries underlying the Maxwell equations are not the Galilean, but the, actually the Poincaré group. And this wasn't really brought to full conclusion in, 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 for Friedman Tyson. And he said, 
following Minkowski's argument, a pure mathematician might easily have conjectured in 1908 that the true invariance group of the universe should be the sitter rather than Poincaré, which is the, the opposite of the errors I have shown you. And then he concludes, suppose that somebody had been told old enough in 1908 to take this idea seriously, you would have concretely, correctly predicted the expansion of the universe 20 years before it was discovered, observationally by Hubble. More importantly, we would have been led to postulate the curvature of space-time, and so we would have considerably eased the path which led to general relativity. Luckily, Einstein was able to reach general relativity the hard way without having it path eased for him by anybody. And also something interesting I have new, the city in fact discovered his model of an expanding universe after the, he learned of Einstein's theory. So it's great to have these kind of workshops to not miss a lot of opportunities, I hope. All right, so lower, uh, uh, I told you already that there might be interesting lower dimensional theories. And I, in any case, the plan was to just scratch the service and hand, then the, hand it over to Daniel, who will do a great job, I'm sure. So I can just um, really scratch the surface by giving you um, just a little bit of algebraic considerations for this. And for that, I just, we just looked actually at lower dimensional theories. And these lower th dimensional theories can be written down either as transcendent theories in two plus one dimensions or as metric or BF theories or point zone sigma models in one plus one dimensions. And let me just tell you two ingredients that enter this kind of GR-like theories. And one, one is the gauge algebra that we have already been talking about here. You can just take, any, take it from here. And also to supply you with a subalgebra H. And the A is a Lie algebra value at one form with a spin connection, omega, and a field band E. But as you can see, there is a second ingredient for this kind of models that I'm looking here, and that is an invariant metric. And that might call for troubles if you think about it, because the non this should be a non-degenerate symmetric invariant bilinear form on the Lie algebra, basically a trace or a killing form. And all, most of these limits I've just shown you are actually non-semi-simple Lie algebras. So the killing metric by basically what it is used for, is degenerate. So the question you would now say, Stefan, it looks bad for you. You will not be able to write down a transcendent theory. But the interesting thing is that there is indeed a generalization, or you can still have non-degenerate symmetric invariant bilinear forms for non-semi-simple Lie algebras. But it's not the killing form and metric. And they indeed exist, and this will be part of the topics that will be scratched upon, but let me just tell you that, that there is a nice um, um, theorem or structure theorem by Medina and Revoir, which I have nothing to do with, but it's nice to hear it, I think, at some point in your life. And I was super surprised and found it super nice, so I, I thought I'd tell it to you also. And for that, you take simple Lie algebras and take direct um, sums. Then you get semi simple Lie algebras, and this leads to uh, Lie algebras with invariant metric. You can also take the one dimensional and take direct products, and again, it leads to a non degenerate invariant metric. And the only ingredient you have to add is something called the double extension, and that's the, what they basically showed. And this double extension is taking a Lie algebra G, and this G and H have nothing to do with the sub algebras I've just talk, been talking about, but it's again. So sorry for the same notation, but G is a, is a Lie subalgebra, uh, is a Lie algebra, but this Lie algebra has to have already an invariant metric. And then you take another algebra H and H bar, which has to fulfill some conditions, and you do a double extension. Basically, this is doing the following here, which I will not go into details, and you can read about it in the, the nice paper, especially if you speak French. And um, but just taking G and double extension, it's not the central extension, it's really more. And you end up with a Lie algebra, which has, again, an invariant metric. E example you want to have in mind is exactly the example that Witten also used in his 
John Simon's paper for Poincaré algebra, the Poincaré algebra is non semi simple, so you shouldn't have a killing form that is non degenerate. But nevertheless, you have one, and this can easily be seen here. In that case, G is actually trivial, and it's just the commuta this commutation relations, as you can see here. And you indeed get this invariant metric. So it, indeed, this explains also the example view, you know, and you can use it also to reverse engineer invariant metrics if you don't want, have one, and that's what you also did partially. Okay, but having this double extension, maybe just to tell you the last bit is you have to take that G has to be either a billion or a double extension and direct products of it, and H has to be either simple or one-dimensional. Otherwise, you will not lead to, it would not lead to new um, the algebras with invariant metrics. But that is, of course, shown in their paper. And then taking direct products of all of this leads to, in principle, all metric Lie algebras, which is actually a quite powerful theorem, in my opinion. Okay. So now one would I, I, I conclude with a major cliffhanger. And uh, now you would, of course, have all the tools, and you now would like to look at these uh, lower dimensional theories. But to see this in action, you have to go to the talk on Thursday from 11 to 12 by Daniel Gramilla, or look at our papers, or all the other papers that we Right to reference, hopefully rightfully. And with that, I sum up. I think uh, I'm okay in time. Let me just maybe, so maximally symmetric space times, you can think about them as homogeneous spaces. They fall into four categories, Laurentian, Carolian, Galilean, and Aristotelian. And maybe a short outlook. Of course, you, you might want to know do this also in any dimension, and it might be interesting to do that. But let me also highlight, of course, that there might be another interesting talk, of course, having all these Carolian Galilean limits. You might now wonder if you're at the higher spin workshop, what happens to higher spin algebras? And there might be, I, I'm sure there is actually uh, going to be a great talk by Andrea Compagnoni on Ga Carolian and Galilean higher spin algebra, which I'm looking forward to. So thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, <laughs> did I answer all the questions that were along the way? Because I. Maybe. Do you put that extensions? That's an excellent question. Uh, partially, yes. So, not myself, but Jose Figueroa of Ferrin and um, his student. We looked at supersymmetric extensions. So, since I wasn't involved, I don't know too much about the details, but I know that they did. And for the part one cases, they, they also looked at for what did they do? I think they looked for some specific, I think they couldn't do it in full generality. So, they, they, they restricted to some specific class of supersymmetry, and then they got very far. But I, I had, they did, but I, I don't know of the, the full result. <laughs> And I also think that they couldn't do it in this full generality because it's there's a lot of more a lot of structure emerges for this non um, non variation solutions. So in this this story is conformable to No, I think so. You, you, you in, in in this thing you don't see this ideas so because it's different constants. So. Yeah. No, no, for that you, okay, in the way I think I would, I would try to look at it is to, if you take SO32, you have different quotients, and one of them is to take in the terms of the usual Poincaré way to think about it, the Lorentz group. But if you want to have a lower dimensional space, you have to add, of course, one more generator to quotient by. And that's actually, and in all the ADS CFT papers, you, you, you see how this, this Lie algebra is connected to each other. So you now take actually a different quotient mm -hmm. space. So you so you don't reproduce this holographic story like where you get Minkowski or ADS and theta and cos and so on. I mean, that, that is something we are trying to look at, to be honest. I, and, I, uh, I, okay. I, I have no, I think it would be nice to see this on this kind of level. Yeah. And, but and, I, I'm not sure it, it is. Related question: If you start with semi-simple group, yeah, 
probably you can still get all these, but completely away. But there's this maybe you have more direct. But you know, in conformal geometry, they like even to think about uh, the theta or Minkowski space as nevertheless as a concept of conformal group, but with certain symmetry properties. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah. That is actually one of the things that might be interesting to, to look at. I mean, all, the, all these interesting things I've heard about Cartan geometries and so on and so forth. I have to admit, I, I'm not very familiar with a lot of these topics. So it might easily be true that this provides additional structure to simplify a lot of this analysis. But I, I really don't know. <laughs> but the, 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 the interesting part is, or the interesting part is, a lot of this is somewhat very intertwined because exactly you start from something semi-simple and end up with actually, except ADS, DS, and the like, and everything else is non-semi-simple. So you are usually a little bit out of the window of, of the usual mathematical specifications that one has, because it's in generic dimension. And also even in terms of homogeneous spaces, it's not that, these are not the necessarily standard examples you see everywhere, because for example, the light cone to some extent is a homogeneous space that is not reductive. I mean, it's not nothing too crazy, but very often we start with reductive is the th one of the things you impose if you start looking into this kind of thing. So it's a little bit, it's, it's a, at, at least it's it, a little bit non standard to some extent in, in this sense. It's not just simply algebra. But I agree, it might be useful to, to think about this in, term, in, in different terms. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so you talk about Cartan geometry and possible generalization of general relativity. Uh, so are you able at least to link this construction to uh, Newton Cartan gravity? Because it should be sort of uh, well, I'm not this stuff, but it should be a sort of uh, Cartan geometry associated to your Galilean space, right? Yeah. So is it clear the connection in that case at least? I mean, I haven't done it yet, <laughs> so I don't know in function. What, what is true to some extent, or what has already been shown, is that this, uh, let me just show it to you, that these Chansan theories, for example, based on Galilean algebras with two central extensions, they have been already mapped to, to, to kind of rather Lifshitz gravitational theories and to this Cartan geometry. Yeah, it might be the four dimensional case. Yeah, I think three plus one, because there, there is all this. Newton Cartan yeah, and yeah. and so on. Yeah. It looks very close, but uh, yeah, I, I think one of the things has been done. Or, uh, yeah, to some extent, I think what people, uh, at least one part of the community that I know a little bit is, is people who are starting with the homogeneous space and then gauge the algebra to obtain uh, some kind of Newton Cartan. And, uh, indeed, indeed, this has been done, for example, for if you if you start with the Poincare algebra, uh, with the Bargman algebra, the central extension of the Galilean algebra, then you end up with some Cartan geometric like theory. So indeed, it's true. This is very much related to 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 what people call gauging algebras. I think I'm trying to write down just for it. Like Eric yeah. Bergshoff and, and Jan Rosello. Related to these, do you know if someone tried to do the same for uh, your Caronian spaces instead? Yeah, yes, Carol, or whatever. Yeah. So one of the Carolians that you have inside. Yeah, funny. So I think for Carol, this has been done. The various authors. And yes, Carol, I'm actually not sure. I mean, we are actually finishing one paper. We are actually doing the ADS Carol case. And all the other ones, I, I think that the problem is very scheduled. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure, I, I, I wouldn't claim a complete overview of the literature, but, but I think for Carol, this has been done for the light cone to some extent. This has also been, I think, partially done. And I think for the Galilean case with central extensions, this has also been looked at already. Yeah. But indeed, this, this is somehow where you would expect to end up with what people to some extent have already been done. Thank you.